What's that? Oh, yeah, that's in there. Uh -huh. These four. Uh huh? That's it. Wraps, meet things. We're good. Oh. Uh, let's see. He's the blockchain. He's good. They're not in order. They're not in order. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Uh, hi, everybody. Welcome. I hope you grabbed lunch. Is everyone all full and ready to go? All right, cool. Uh, my name is Matt DiNapoli. I am um, a dev evangelist for Cisco DevNet. Um, I work with uh, Connected Mobile Experience and Meraki. So if you have any questions and want to talk about that, feel free to come up to me and do that. Uh, we have an interesting set of talks over the next hour and a half. Um, we're supposed to have four speakers. The fourth one hasn't shown up yet, so we might just have three, so we'll see. Uh, first up is Kamal. He's from GE. Um, he's going to be talking to us about blockchain. And just a quick note, once he's done talking here, he does have a workshop over there. So if uh, you guys want to follow up with him afterwards, he'll be in the workshop area. So Kamal, hey. all yours. Yep. Hi, everyone. So before starting, I just want to know, like, how many of you heard about blockchain? Nice. How many of you know the protocol and details behind blockchain? That's interesting to me, because that's what I want to cover. <laughs> OK, I'll just go through. Uh, this is a very big, wide topic, so I'll just go a little bit fast, taking the time into constraint. But let's see, since one speaker dropped out, I can squeeze in some time. So this is my agenda. If you guys can understand what is blockchain after attending this session, that's a win for me. Because blockchain is the future. The next future is all about blockchain. The way we have to define the blockchain is blockchain is internet of value. Blockchain is going to disrupt the way we are seeing the world today. It's going to disturb the way we are doing business today. You already seeing a lot of trend with the digital currency. There's a lot of hype in the market about the digital currency. Okay? So what is this blockchain all about? Blockchain is nothing but it's a decentralized database and a peer-to-peer -peer network that actually stores a registry of transaction. This is too much? Okay. Let's go, let's break it into small, small pieces, okay? So what did this decentralized database mean, right? Currently, we are having a lot of databases where we store and persist huge amount of data. But with the blockchain, it's a different format altogether. We store data in blocks where we only store things which are very much required for us. Example, let's see the blocks. Somewhere in 1980s or 1970s, when we used to pay our bills, we used to pay in checks. In a month, example, you are giving like 30, 40 checks. You take all the check receipts, pile it, lump it together, and keep it in a cupboard. The next month, you give another 30 checks. So you keep on piling your check lumps together. So this is what block is called. I'm just giving a normal example where what exactly you're trying to do is you're not literally storing the money. You are just storing the transaction. The day you have given the check, the amount for which you have given the check, the reference of the bank. You might be having multiple banks. So this is what the data consists of. So once this data is bulked together, it is actually moved as a block. So this block, once you move a block, to move the other block, you need to know the previous block hash. So you have to know the reference of previous hash. That is the reason why it is so secure. So you continuously need to have the root hash. You need to literally go to the root hash to really break it, which is impossible. Right? It is basically, in our computer science basics, we have something called Merkley tree. It's kind of a binary search tree, which keeps on expanding based on the hash what we are creating, right? I'll not go more into the technicalities of Merkley tree hashing and everything. I just want like, to understand the basic concepts and jargons of blockchain. What are the common terms you keep on hearing? Ledger, 
smart contracts, blocks, transactions, right? So we know what are blocks. Blocks is nothing but like, let's keep on pushing the data where we need to know the previous hash before pushing the block. Now, what is registry of transaction? It is not registry of data. We don't store data. Now, how is this blockchain actually registry of transaction? I'll give you one example. You want to store your identity on blockchain. What do I mean by identity on blockchain is like, I go to a store and they ask me like, are you ever 18? I'll take out my ID and show, right? Literally, you don't need to use your ID to prove that you are ever 18. If you use blockchain, what blockchain persists is not your personal passport information or ID information. It only persists the information where it need to contact to prove that you are above 18. That's the place where you will persist in blockchain. If you are storing something like your passport or personal identity, you are misusing blockchain. You are just giving the reference with whom you need to talk to, get, to prove that you are above 18. Then comes the peer-to-peer -peer network, right? So what is this peer-to-peer -peer network? Peer-to-peer -peer network is like we have multiple nodes, and every node can actually write a block, read a block, and validate your transaction. So you are using the entire peer-to-peer -peer network to validate all the transactions what is happening. For example, if I'm actually writing something to the blockchain, saying that there are like 20, 30 nodes spread across, and each, the beauty of this blockchain protocol is each node is having the information, entire information what you are sending as block, it is spread across the 20 nodes. The moment you give a new transaction, send a block, all the 20 nodes will actually verify whether this block is valid or not. And you need more than 51% of the nodes acceptance to approve a block. That's how the transaction is approved. <coughs> so what is the smart contract? For example, if I ask you, like, you are giving a check, and I am the banker, right? How I'll validate whether your check is right or wrong? There are certain things I see. Like, did you sign it? The amount is right. You have written in words. The date is right. There are certain things. So if I actually transform the same things, the rules, into a program, that is called smart contracts. So you define your business logic, how you want your data and your transactions to be defined. So that is the basic thing. Like you are adding behavior to data. That's what the smart contract is. You'll say how, when, and who can modify the data. These are certain rules. So it's the same thing where what you are doing is you are continuously, the institution of banking right now is like centralized. You give a check or you do a transaction, it is in the centralized place. So once it is moved to the blockchain, it is not centralized. The data is spread across different nodes, and you can continuously read and validate because it is continuously secured. So let's come back, because I want to cover the major part of the IoT piece. So basics, if you are very clear on the fundamentals of blockchain, blockchain uses blocks to persist. To write a block, you need the previous block information, that is the previous hash information. It's a transaction of registry. It, it only just stores the transactions. It is a peer-to-peer -peer network. It is decentralized, and it is distributed. And the advantage what we get is like permissionless. Anyone can write anything. You don't need a permission to write something. It's a permissionless. Second thing is it is transparent. Who don't like a transparent system? Everyone likes a transparent system. It is transparent. And it is immutable. The best thing is it is immutable. The blocks what you write are like you can't delete those blocks. It is per persisted and it is immutable. And it is secure because you have a certain system, the nodes, number of nodes who are verifying your transactions and validating whether it is right or wrong. And there should be a 51% acceptance should be there to approve your transaction. That's what the blockchain basic things are all about. Now, why blockchain in IoT? Right now, I'm very happy. I'm, I'm getting a Fitbit. I'm getting my data. Everything is there in cloud. I'm having an app. I'm seeing everything. Why are you bringing this blockchain to IoT? I'm happy where I am, <laughs> right? But that's not the case. This is the current state of IoT. If you say, 
all these devices are connected to the cloud, right? Continuously data is going into the cloud and everything is centralized. We are actually, sent, we, there is no democracy to these devices. They have to be something like a master and slave. These devices continuously need to talk to one centralized cloud system or solution or something to get approval, to store stats and everything. There is no democracy. What blockchain gives you is the democracy to devices. You device decide what they want to do, right? So today, like everything is going to the cloud and this is what the challenge which you have covered, right? So what is the challenge if we go in this model, what are the challenges? By Gartner has predicted like by around 2020, 50 billion devices will be connected. If we go in this route, what are the challenges we are going to face if we are building an IoT system or IoT based product? We are actually, there's a, the, there is a cost of connectivity. How many VMs you keep, keep on bringing in, right? There's a lot of cost of connectivity. There is no future proof. There is no, it's not so secure, right? So how blockchain really helps? What is the desired state where we have to be? If you are having a car, you are having a mobile or anything like, each devices should talk to each other and that's how it should happen, right? I'll cover some of the use cases, what we, are, what we can foresee. If you start thinking with this mindset of blockchain, the entire most of the businesses are going to get disrupted because you are actually taking out the centralized command system. So what is this peer-to-peer -peer will actually enable in the IoT space, right? It enables device to device, device to human and cloud communication, right? And it also addresses the cost of connectivity. There is no certain cost because the, the, the entire system is spread across in the different nodes. You are, you, do, you are not bothered about it because you have an ecosystem where there are already nodes available. How we can implement what is it I'll cover, okay? and it is highly secure. As we know, it is based on the binary search tree, Merkley tree thing, where you literally can't crack it. There was, a, there was, a read, uh, there was some discussion happening with my team member th on the other day, and we were reading some blog, how we can hack a blockchain system. S then we read some blogs, and it, we realized that if the blockchain code, the code, the blocks what you are persisting are so strong, it will take around 954 years to actually hack a blockchain system, provided you live so long, right? So how these things is like, these are like smart devices. For example, I'll give you one use case. I'm just shifting from my slides to the content, taking the time into consideration. For example, there's a supply chain system, right? And you have some cookies, some jars, uh, some candies, everything in your store in one aisle. When customers come, they buy some stuff, and you see the quantity getting reduced. So some physical human, some person should go there, see the quantity, and replace it. Think of a supply chain system. You're building something, and you want to actually need some new parts. How you can replace? If blockchain is enabled for this thing, where all the vendors, as well as the company, everyone knows what they need, and this smart system, can actually, the device itself says, I need so many number of parts. It informs to the device, the blockchain. And the vendor actually responds being that, okay, this is the transaction, this is the shipping. So everyone can write to the blocks. That's how you can actually address a lot of supply chain ca use cases. So what all things, other things you can do? You can actually track the device and asset identity. What do I mean by identity? Example, you're having a car, and you bought the car somewhere around 2004. You took car for servicing like 100 times till now, and in between like two, three owners changed. So every record of that particular asset, you can track using blockchain. So all the transactions, you can certainly use blockchain as audit history, right? This, that is an absolute use case for an audit history where you can really track the ownership, identity, and everything of it. You can also track warranty of that particular asset. So, so in the blockchain, 
you can write data but you can't delete data if you want to delete data how i can do it you have to deploy your chain code back again you have to work on the entire code since you know the data and you have to deploy again that's how you can actually rewrite it and that is like lots and lots of effort so what else is available to do this right so when you see how this actually blockchain verifies the uh, block and everything right we heard some at least the terminologies like bitcoin ethereum litecoin these are all new currencies digital currencies we've been hearing it and they are trending and the value proposition is increasing day by day right so what it is all about right there is something called the consensus like the consensus is like how the nodes exam i told you right there are 20 nodes are there and 20 nodes verify uh, your identity of the block right how it is going to verify and what is the value add right yes can i join the blockchain system where i can provide only the infrastructure yes you can and those are called mining miners so they provide the vms and they join as miners how they how it happens is there is a concept called co consensus where there are two ways you can define the consensus proof of work and proof of stake what is proof of work a new transaction comes all the 20 nodes in the system receives the transaction and the first node which resolves this huge mathematical complication saying that this transaction is genuine it will inform to the rest of the nodes the rest of the nodes also parallelly works on the system and they approve if more than 51% nodes approve it says okay this is a genuine transaction and it is approved so that is proof of work so once you join as a minor thing when your node actually solves the problem for the first first you will get rewarded and this is the this is the basic white paper published by Sa satoshi Na satoshi he is the guy who actually started this blockchain protocol white paper and rewarded your node will get rewarded and you will be paid back in the digital currency so there are a lot of other platforms started and this is one of the thing is called ethereum you guys might heard ethereum ethereum not only provides digital currency it provides a platform to develop apps using blockchain example i'll take a use case hope i don't get into trouble okay <laughs> so there is an uber right uber is right now centralized it's all centralized like there are some cab drivers and uber actually do the math saying that what is the time what is the route and what is the cost everything if example if blockchain is implemented there is no centralized smart contract which is running to decide the time price and everything is since blockchain is decentralized a driver will say this is what it is i am available or something the smart contract will run and everything is like peer to peer it is decentralized and distributed there is no centralized place where you decide what is the price right it will disrupt lot of uh, businesses like alibaba airbnb these are all businesses might get disrupted if these solutions are executed properly and this content is not mine you can read it on the internet also okay so ethereum is one thing which actually provides this particular platform to develop your applications so what is the value add to ethereum when they run the smart contract each smart contract when it is executed and passed on to you they charge ethers so the revenue model of ethereum platform is they run the smart contracts for you and they you have to pay minimum ethers for it okay fine i'm ready to pay that then a new open source thing came called hyperledger hyperledger right now it's 0.6.8 version and it is coming at 1.0 version which is an open source model under linux foundation it actually supports your smart contracts <laughs> and pluggable consensus model right now what are the consensus model which i explained is proof of work and proof of stake 
Okay, proof of stake is nothing but once the transaction comes, you keep a stake saying that this transaction is valid and the entire network accepts it. That is called proof of stake. You can also come up with one, one more consensus model and you can plug in with this hyperledger thing. It's open source. You can go, Google it, get the boss release, take a VM, install. It is all straightforward. And it offered on Bluemix as a service also. IBM Bluemix, you can figure it out. It's an offered as a uh, service also. So in general, blockchain will help in solving a lot of IoT problems when you potentially see the number of devices are growing and you want to scale it, blockchain is the only way we can actually solve <coughs> and empower the devices and give democracy to the devices. Rather than we deciding what to do, devices will de decide what they want. Example, right now there is no functional value being added. I have a toaster at home which is like cloud enabled and it's keep on sending information to the cloud. What is the value that I am getting? Do I am getting a better toast? No. <laughs> just, I'm just sending some data. That's it. Right? This is what you need to see. Like how what is the value add? How the peer-to-peer -peer can communicate and give me that value add. That is what going to blockchain is going to help me in the IoT world. Thank you. You can reach me on this. And this is what my company asked me to say, and we are hiring. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Are there any questions for Kamal? Yes. Yeah. I'm interested in the size of the chain in small factor devices. Mm -hmm. Is that something you've got to consider? Yeah, the supply chain is what you're talking about? Oh, the actual size of the blockchain itself over periods of time. Yeah, over a period of a time. It's a typical problem what is happening with the Bitcoin also, right? The blockchain size is becoming so big and they have to de split it. Somehow they have to split it and make the... It's a basic thing where you have your Merkley tree and there is a root hash and you have to validate the things. You need to traverse to the root hash. You literally need to disrupt this thing. So Hyperledger actually is coming up with some solution in 1.0 where you can define where you can actually split at what point in a diff in a useful way. Yes, that is a constraint in the blockchain. Yeah, you're right. The size becomes huge and humongous. You really need to find and find out where is the root, right? You're right. You're right. But you really need to know informed to the nodes who are validating your transaction to figure out like till what level they need to go and do this. So that is a pluggable model. What hype, when I'm saying like pluggable consensus, that is a pluggable model the Hyperledger is coming is. You can define your consensus till when and which level you can actually figure out. Did I answer your question or did I make some answer? <laughs> yeah, obviously, right? You'll be losing the data. You can certainly query the data. The data is not lost. You can certainly query the data. But to approve the transaction, to what level you need to verify, those are the consensus you can actually change using this pluggable model. Again, if you're, if you're storing all this data, let's say, for example, on one chain, and you're measuring once you transaction on a device, mm -hmm. if you don't have enough storage, eventually, after five or six or one of them, it depends how long the life of that device is. Yeah. Yeah. It depends on the transaction, right? Example, you're continuously sending your transaction data. That's the reason you should not misuse the blockchain to persist your data. You should only use the blockchain as a registry of transactions. So in, if it is a small device, what is the transaction which is very important to you? If the device is alive, do you want to every time, it's a time series data. Do you want to send a time series data to blockchain? Or you really want to use the blockchain to register only certain transactions so which you're... For example, what you're saying is, say you create a ticket, then details of the ticket as a database is blockchain. Blockchain which should not purchase the entire no, no, details the of the ticket, ticket just the ticket ID, yeah. And then go back and provide it to your application. Yeah. That, that's how you need to use the blockchain. Yeah. All right, any other questions? No? Thank you for that. That Thank was a good you. discussion. Um, I believe that the topic of his discussion is called IoT Inception. <laughs>
Yeah. Um, While he's getting set up there, I should mention, um, we are getting towards the afternoon of the end, uh, day two here. Um, so, if, but if you haven't checked them out, the mini hacks are um, in the back corner past the workshop section in, um, in the back of the demo, demo pod section. Check those out if you want to do some hands-on stuff. They're fun. We have, I think, five of them supported in a few technologies, and we give out some uh, bottle openers and fidget cubes if you... Uh, do two of them. So uh, check those out. We also have our learning labs and people to help out with those as well. So check those out at uh, learninglabs.cisco.com. And I'll turn it over to Olivier. I have just a little problem. Oh, okay. <laughs> I reboot my computer. Oh, no. <laughs> he has to reboot. All right. <laughs> we'll kill time. <laughs> yes. You have uh, some uh, something to say? Uh, not really. <laughs> <laughs> Are you guys ha enjoying your time at DevNet Create? We appreciate you coming. Um, this is the first time we've done it, if you haven't heard that a million times already. Um, and we, you know, whenever you do something new, you aren't sure if people are going to be receptive to it. But it turns out that it, it seems like you guys are enjoying yourselves. Um, are you guys finding the content to be appropriate? Is it what you expected? Yeah? No? Well, let us know. We have feedback loops in from the DevNet Create site. Um, let us know how we can improve. We always want to do better next year. Um, and I appreciate the time. And are you good to go? Okay. Or no, still, still a minute. <laughs> Sorry. Oh no, that's okay. We got. Um, we are gonna, only going to have three speakers. Um, so Olivier is going to go next, and then we have Patricia after that. Um, our fourth speaker uh, was a no-show, so unfortunately, you get a little extra time um, to check some of the other stuff out. Talk to people at the demo pods. We're getting there. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? Yes. Um, I didn't hear much about the DevNet organization. Oh. Why you Good question. Um, so DevNet's been around for uh, officially four years. Uh, we actually launched our developer.cisco.com site um, in December of 2013. Uh, but we had our big coming out party at Cisco Live, which is actually in San Francisco at the Moscone Center in 2014. Uh, May of 2014, and um, the whole idea was to provide developer outreach for people um, to integrate against Cisco platforms. Cisco historically has not been known as a software company. Um, you know, we still have a lot, a long way to go to change that perception. Um, and so DevNet is that's why we're there. The main the main idea is come to DevNet. We will help you guys integrate against our platforms. Our platforms are becoming more and more open. Uh, with the use of APIs, and so IoT is a big um, proponent of that, and so that's that's why we're here. So thank you for that question. <laughs> I just assumed everyone knew what DevNet was, and I need to stop doing that. So thank you. I will now turn it over to Olivier. Okay. Thank you, guys. Uh, so my talk is about energy measurement uh, of Android Things and Raspberry Pi with I don't know a complicated title for a complicated subject. Uh, to resume, it is. Energy measurement of IoT by IoT, a sort of inception. The, the goal of this its, uh, talk is to explain you the energy on IoT. Uh, I'm Olivier Filippo, and I am the CTO of Green Spectre. Green Spectre is a startup, a French startup, as you can hear with my accent. Uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, and we work on energy efficiency for software developers. We, we, we want to make the software more efficient, consume less. Uh, it is a big problem because um, while you need to measure energy, uh, software is eating the world. We have a lot of that, and it needs energy. This morning on the keynote, uh, Amanda was saying that it was magical, but with IoT and with API, with uh, uh, IT there is also black magic because energy uh, and it, it, there is a lot of study about that. Uh, uh, transporting bits no use 50% uh, more energy than the world aviation. So we we are a, a domain which consume a lot of energy. We do a lot of things, but we consume a lot of things. 
uh, of energy. And uh, if we continue, uh, we will use twice as much. So Haiti will be a, a big continent <laughs> with a big consumption. So we have to, to change some things and to take into account that. Uh, uh, and if you don't care about the Earth, uh, you, you, I think the user sees this problem because mobility is everywhere. So user can see the, the, the decreasing of autonomy. Uh, you can feel it when you plug your smartphone every evening uh, and more. And with IoT, it will be the same because hardware uh, is supposed to to have autonomy of uh, several years, but it is not the, the, the truth. Uh, and I think if, as a user, on your home you have 100 of device, and you must uh, change the battery every, of year, every year of about 100 of uh, device, you, you will not be agree. <laughs> you will feel, feel uh, like a slave of the IT, and not uh, the IT for the human. So. Yes, uh, there, there is something to, to change. And other domains have changed, have such a problem, automotive. And before, there, were, there were technical controls like RPM, kilometers, uh, and they changed to more efficient control. And with, with gallon per kilometer or liter uh, by kilometer, you can see if you accelerate you, uh, with your car, you see that you use a lot of energy. So you can change your, your, your way to, to, to drive. How we measure energy in IoT and IT in general? We have profiling tools, we have CPU, we have performance tools. So we don't measure efficiency. We have no tools and we don't use a tool to measure energy. So it's not so true because on your smartphone, you have a little icon with a battery. It is the first step to energy measurement. It is a percentage of battery, and you have a first measure. And oh, this measure is done. In Android, for example, you see an example of a Nexus 6 specification. There is electronic component, with, which is a, a coolant counter, which permit to have the energy. And every smartphone has such electronics. And since Android 5, you have an API, and you can get the energy. So you can integrate this energy in your software on your test. That, that's the work of Green Spectre, for example. And in IoT, uh, uh, a classical architecture, energy is everywhere. So in the smartphone, we can measure, but in hardware, like uh, things, there is no no such counter. You can uh, you, you you can measure it in the gateway also, which will permit to to make the object discuss between us and to add a layer of intelligence. You will no uh, will have no energy, no energy information. So the, the the aim of the talk is to work on the gateway and to provide some clues to to have energy. The use case is to send the weather information by text to, uh, to user. Really a simple test case, and we use Raspberry Pi, uh, which is an uh, awesome platform to do project. On the OS, th a newcomer, which is uh, Android Things, and uh, uh, it's really great for this operating system. Uh, for the weather, we have a Piromoroni, which is a weather station with uh, pressure information, uh, temperature, and you can do project with uh, uh, some dollars. Uh, it's really great. And we will use the Cisco Tropo API to send SMS. So it is a use case. Uh, Android Things, if you use to develop in Android, uh, you will be able to develop in Android Things because it is the same tool. See, it's Android Studio, it is the same layer. You have just one thing more, which is uh, uh, the, the Things support library. So in, uh, if you are used to develop in Android, in one hour you can have a project uh, on IoT and Raspberry because 
uh, you have images available. So, how to measure, what we do for, to measure energy? We use the Arduino uh, to manage energy. Simple. And to measure energy, it is really, things, really simple. Uh, uh, we use Chant. And it is the same architecture as in your smartphone. Chant, it is a little resistor when you pass elect where, uh, uh, where current pass. And we cut the cable which powers the Raspberry. And uh, uh, with uh, the shunt, we you can buy on the Adafruit website, the same thing, the same site, where you buy uh, Arduino. It is ten dollars. So the shunt is really simple. After here the final infrastructure. So you have the the Raspberry, which is a uh, link to the Ethernet. Uh, you have a power cable which is cut and which passed by the chant. And uh, the Raspberry, the Arduino manage the measure and the measure is sent to the data, to the computer. So it is the inception. On Arduino, it is really simple. You take the chain voltage, the current, and if you remember of a loom Ohm low, you can have the power. So we send the power to the computer. <coughs> On the Raspberry Pi and uh, Android things, it is the same thing. Really, if you use to develop Android, uh, you create a simple application, and in some lines, we send the, the message and the information to the web service uh, with a f number. And we do that every second. So I, I, I don't pass. Uh, uh, I pass to the result, and the result is here. So in idle, you see, idle is when your Raspberry Pi with Android Studio uh, with um, Android things don't do nothing. You have a constant power consumption. So okay. After when we send the SMS every one second. With uh, with some information, we have some peak. So here we can say we have nothing to say, and we must do projection. And for IoT, if you want autonomous, I sorry, autonomous IoT. Yes, uh, we take a battery, which is a ten thousand battery, milliampere hours, to understand smartphone are three and four thousand uh, ampere hours. Here, the reference is the idle. So the idle is uh, you leave the, the, the raspberry, do nothing. First finding is that the autonomy is 37 hours. So <laughs> if we want a, a big autonomy, with the first finding is that with the Raspberry Pi and Android things, uh, you have just uh, two days of autonomy. You will have to change the, the battery every two days or to charge. So Raspberry Pi is not I is good for prototyping, but for real uh, use case with a big autonomy, it's not the good thing. You have to do some better electronics, or you have to plug your your Raspberry Pi to the grid. So it is the first thing to to say. After you see that. When we run the Android application, you have a decrease of two hours. So, okay. And we send the SMS every one second, you have 20 minutes. So, Cisco API is not, consume not a lot of energy. <laughs> I, I think I, I will be able to come back to the DevNet too, because if uh, it was bad, I think. <laughs> uh, so, Yes, uh, there is no energy. What we do is after we plug the, 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 the weather station, because before there was no weather station, and we, 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 we see the information of, uh, uh, of temperature, which is viewed on the alphanumeric display and sent to the SMS. So there is a decrease of eight hours. So we see that uh, it's a big decrease of autonomy, and 
for the moment you can say and uh, ask, uh, is it is the hardware or the software fault? <laughs> because we would say, okay, software, no, <laughs> software is virtual, there is zero one, zero one, and it is hardware which consume. Um, I, I do a parenthesis about a, a use case we have. We measure the Android uh, Google system UI, which is the interface of uh, Google. You know, the status bar when you go to the notification, the recent app, uh, also uh, all the, the, the icon. And we see the, it is the same thing. The reference is the, the energy when you uh, keep the smartphone on with the screen. Uh, so 100 microampere hours by second. When you show the recent app, you have an increase of energy. And when you show I the status bar, the energy uh, uh, is multiplied by three. So it is a big energy consumption. It is the same thing than a video. So a video is a, a long during of uh, playing, but just one second for the status bar, but just for viewing some icons. So it's not a, a good thing. And why we have such a consumption? It is not the hardware, because the hardware is here. The hardware uh, consume with the screen uh, 100 microampere hours. So it, it is the same here. And it is a software, because all the CPU, all the data, there is a, uh, a software which consume. And to explain what happened in system UI, uh, y you have Android system with the software events, the hardware events, with management. On your software here, and on system UI, you, you listen all these events. So when the user touch the screen, uh, you open all the listener, you listen all the battery events, the, the Wi-Fi event, a lot of system, and all is put, oh sorry, all is put on the, the algorithm and we, 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 um, we put all on all the graphics. So there is a lot of redraw, a lot of redraw on the, the, the interface and that's why it's explained the uh, high energy uh, consumption. The user don't see anything because you have eight, eight CPU core <laughs> on the smartphone but there is energy consumption. What we see is that here is it, it is the event. The event are not managed. We said we, we don't need to, to program with pooling, but we need to go to event programming. So we go to event programming everywhere, but there is a, a drawback, and it is a drawback. So events are like butterfly effect, and it is the same thing on, on uh, IoT. There will be a lot of events which will be sent to the data center, to other objects, and if we don't manage the event, we will have some drawback effect. And it's, it is the same thing for our use case. We, on the our Raspberry Pi, with uh, the rainbow at uh, weather station, uh, the, the, the temperature is uh, sent every millisecond. So Every many seconds, we said to the display to, to change. And we said also to the SMS to be sent. So there is a lot of event. What we do, we just put a loop, a, a counter, and we manage one event every 20 events. So 19 events were not managed, not sent to the alphanumeric display, not sent to the, to the network. And we increase the autonomy by 40 minutes. So it is a first, uh, first evolution, a, a first improvement, but we can go uh, further on the optimization. It shows that the, the, the hardware, yes, is not really important. It is not um, consuming. So after you, you can continue to say, no, <laughs> it is the hardware. <laughs> Uh, and uh, you go to premature opt optimization because a lot of developers said, okay, I don't want to optimize. We, <laughs> and we, uh, uh, it is a definition of uh, Donald Knox uh, on the 17th. Uh, uh, and so we, all the developers have on the brain, 
premature optimization is the root of all evil. So, uh, okay, but uh, it was 40 years ago, and now we are not the same hardware, we, are, we have not the same layer of software, we have a, a lot of layer, uh, so there is no premature optimization, and we saw that on all uh, software uh, project we have. When you begin to optimize, you, you, you have gain. You can reduce energy consumption, you can uh, uh, avoid obsolescence of hardware, you can put more features on your software, so it is really important, and the event, uh, uh, with the event, we see that. So as a conclusion, so IoT energy consumption will bloat. I, I, I think that we hardware manufacturer will I improve the hardware. It is the same thing on the computer, but software is going faster, uh, slower. So software is really not following the improvement of, of, of hardware. And it is not code, it is event, it is data. Data we send, data we manage, so we, we need to, to, to think about that. Uh, and uh, what we, we try to, to push also is the measure, the energy measurement. Not only the performance, but the, but the energy. Because if I ask on the room who measure energy on this software or hardware, I think nobody. And uh, so, so we need to measure because if we don't measure energy, the user will, be, will consume a lot of energy. And efficient IoT is good for the Earth because energy reduction, but also for the user because you will, be, uh, you will have a, a better experience by not plugging your, your IoT to charge it or to change the battery. Uh, so it will be a, a great thing. So you can follow me or keep in touch with... Uh, the website. Thank you. Thanks, Olivier. Are there any questions for Olivier? No? Good. All right, cool. Uh, next up, we have uh, uh, Patricia San Pedro. Uh, she is one of ours, uh, intelligence to your IoT platforms. So we've talked about energy, we've talked about uh, managing transactions with blockchain, and now we're going to talk about adding artificial intelligence. So, we'll let her get set up, and then we'll get rocking and rolling. <coughs> cool? No, any sound. OAV. <laughs> uh, while we're waiting here, uh, there is a activity you can do while you're walking around. Um, there's a bingo card. I don't if you haven't picked one up yet. They're at the registration desk, and there are just a number of activities that you can do, um, like find a dev evangelist that has a bunch of stickers on their laptop. So it's just kind of an icebreaker type thing. Um, and then if you complete enough, I believe you get T-shirts. So the cool T-shirts that we've been wearing. So. You're all good to go? Yes. All right, excellent. I'll turn over to Patricia. Hello, my name is Patricia San Pedro. I'm a software engineer at Cisco, and I will talk about where artificial intelligence meets Internet of Things for anomaly detection. Well, here my biography, if you, can, if you are interested, you can check out on the website. But I will start my presentation talking about a number, 37,000 people per year. What is this number about? It can be a lot of things. For example, it can be the people that change uh, jobs in the US, the robotories that there are in Europe, but not. This number is the number of people that dies of car accidents in the US. This is a huge number. Let me talk about the causes. The main causes are distracted driving, speeding, drunk driving, reckless driving, and when you are driving and there are bad uh, weather conditions. If 
almost all of that you can zoom up like you are having like a bad day and you are distracted. You are not paying attention to the road. Okay, sorry. Um, so now we already have that it's a safety problem and we know the causes. So what does stop us to actually solve that problem? Some of you will tell me like, oh, this is because it's not a financial impact. The companies are not interested in that. But this is not true because actually uh, the logistic companies has uh, lose a lot of money every time that there has an accident. For example, they have to pay uh, the medical costs, the god costs, but the most important thing is that they lost clients, so they lost reliability. So, okay, let's sum up what we have until now. We have a safety impact, a financial impact, and we know already the causes, so uh, what stops us to avoid that? Well, it's not as easy. How you can, even you know the causes, how you can avoid the consequence that it's having an accident. So, in my team, we have seen that a lot of these accidents are caused because the driver cannot pay attention to the road. If you are be able to, uh, to advise the driver that he's having a bad driving pattern when he's engaging that pattern, you will avoid the accident. So, using that approach, we wanted to detect two of these bad driving patterns. That is tailgating and driving careless in dangerous condition. So, in order to advise the driver when he is starting to do that. How we do that? In order to do that, we use artificial intelligence. We use two methodologies, machine learning for detecting tailgating and fuzzy logic for detecting driving careless in dangerous condition. Let me take you to a whole picture of my project. We have cars. This car is sensing, sending uh, nearly real data to our cloud. In our cloud, you can find two main uh, things. The first one is the big data platform, uh, where all the data is processing, and the anomaly detection application, where these patterns are analyzing in order to discover them. OK, which software co libraries we use? There are, we use, for machine learning, we use Lasagne. Um, in the back end, you can find it Ciano. And we use fuzzy logic libraries, like a sky, um, Science fuzzy. So, okay, until now, from now to the end, I will talk about the use cases and what they are and how we actually detect them. So, what is tailgating? I'm sure that almost everyone here have al sometimes done tailgating, but let me take an overview. So, it's when th you are not keeping the distance between you and the car in front of you. So. When you break, the people in front of um, when you are tailgating, the, if the people in front of you break, you have to break. If you slow down, if the people in front of you slow down, you have to break. But if the people in front of you speed up, you will speed up because you are not maintaining the secure distance. This is a huge problem because if the people in front of you break and you don't react on time, you will crash over. So how do we detect that? Actually, it's pretty easy. We just have some input variables that in this case is speed and brake, only sensor data. And we use neural network in order to process that pattern. And finally, we just, uh, our output is if it's an anomaly or if it's not an anomaly. Okay, but now you can ask me, how you can know a pattern if you only have one instance value? But that is because we not only have one instance value, we have 100 values of speed, 100 values of break that are correlated between time. And we actually use a specific time, a specific type of neural network, that is recurrent neural network. This neural network, it's nice because it uh, has memory, so it's be able to understand that maybe the first value and the 30 value has a correlation between them. So we already detect the tailgating. Our accuracy for that is pretty nice, it's 99.1, and the most important thing here is that all the errors that we have are false positive. So, let's talk about the second use case. Driving carless in dangerous condition. But first, let me ask you something. If I'm telling you, 
Yeah, sorry. If I'm telling you I'm driving 49.9 mph, per hour, maybe you tell me I'm driving fast. Maybe you are telling me that I'm driving slow. But I'm sure that I'm driving as much fast as if I'm driving 50.1 mph. per hour. This is because our brain is able to understand these degrees of truth. But if you probably ask a computer, maybe they will not understand that because they work with Boolean logic. Well, so you just have some slots, and if you jump to the next slot, it's done. So maybe I will be in the first value, I will be driving distance, but in the next value, I will be driving high speed. For this reason, we decided to use fuzzy logic. Fuzzy logic. Um, this uh, be able to, for example, if I'm driving 45 miles per hour, I will be driving more like 20% descent speed and 80% higher speed. So it's be able to understand exactly how our brain works. OK, so now that we understand how fuzzy logic works, um, how we detect exactly that bad driving pattern. So in order to do that, we define variables using this logic, the speed of the car, the current condition, and the current weather. And then we just use some rule-based case that everyone will understand. If the speed is high and the condition of the road are poor, and the weather is sunny, then it's unsafe to drive. So here is how we detect this. But driving, let me take you an overview of what actually the workflow of my application goes. Where our cars are sensing data. In this case, we are sending the speed. Big Data Analytics Platform analyzes it and sending to the uh, um, anomaly detection application. They, as the real APIs, like Google Maps and ETC, real-time contextual data. And with that, we are able to detect um, in 0 0.1 second if it's um, a bad driving pattern or not. So as I already have time, because I, will, I want to give you an overview of how you can use fuzzy logic using Python. Because Machine learning, you can find thousands of tutorials on the internet. But I think that fuzzy logic is really interesting. So we just define some variables. And the most interesting is that you just, if you can see, you just define some rules you s that everyone can understand. If weather is sunny or weather is cloudy, then it's not an anomaly. And you just compute that and it works. So let me take you an overview of the results. So as I said, machine learning is so useful. You can detect really difficult patterns using that, but the computational speed is a little bit high in comparison with other artificial intelligence methodologies can be like um, fuzzy logic. And the accuracy for our both case was pretty nice. So my, con my conclusion after doing that project uh, it's like a small projects can have real financial impact, first of all. And then that actually you cannot be, you cannot want to use machine learning because now there is a lot of hype about that. Where you really need to find the correct algorithm for every use case. So thank you so much. Um, if you have any question, you can contact me now or you can contact me by email. Uh, thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions for Patricia? Yes, I do. Oh, okay. Here we go. Um, thanks very much, Patricia. Is there a difference in processing real-time versus historical data for machine learning? Actually, for machine learning, um, this is any difference for them. You just take the data and you process the algorithms. The, the, the difference is for the big data analytics platform. Okay, and um, are there hardware or CPU or memory requirements, or do those resources need to grow based on the amount of data? Yes, of course. You have to scale it up. Okay. Good. Any other questions? No? All right. Um, oh, okay. Okay. 
Yeah, hello, Patricia. I heard that you use some live external API for the contextual data using for the physics logic to detect something like the bad condition, weather condition or something like yes. that. Yes. Yeah, I was wondering if you have an, something else, the uh, contextual data, something like a map or something to, to do more things uh, in your project. Um. Sorry, can you repeat again the question? I mean, uh, uh, how many external uh, contextual data you use in your application to make it more I powerful? I so use the GPS mm -hmm. that basically with the GPS allows me to know the weather and the current road conditions. So I just use two different APIs, but the contextual data is only GPS. So does it mean uh, you or the physiologic things will do the live um, Analysis, analysis, or you can do historical analysis as well. I can do both. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, what, one more question: uh, the data that you were using um, is it actual um, data collected from automobiles, or wh where did you obtain the data set to feed into the system? The data we use, um, we have OBD in the car, so our teammates. Uh, has driving with this OBD, so we collect this data and we mix it up using also some open source uh, self-driving car that Udacity has, has put it in the GitHub. We mix it together, but basically our main source is the OBD that we have in the cars of our teammates. So, yes. Great, thank you. You're welcome. All right, cool. <laughs> thank you. All right, so that is the end of the IoT.